to rule the game-winning hit a single, indelibly etching it in our memories as the biggest single in club history and the Mets' number three moment of all time. Please welcome the man who got the grand single, Robin Ventura. The season that prompted the nickname Miracle Mets is the number two moment in our countdown. It was the year man set foot on the moon. Woodstock and Vietnam were in the news. And one of the great sports stories of the century was unfolding in Queens as the 1969 Mets put together the first winning season in franchise history. In September, New York overtook the first place Cubs to clinch the division. Next, they swept the Braves in the first ever National League Championship Series. And despite the experts' prediction that they had no chance of beating Baltimore, the Miracle Mets shocked the world by grounding the Orioles in five games. The 2-1 pitch. There's a fly ball hit out to the left, waiting is Jones. The Mets are the world champions. Gary Kuzman being my the storybook season of 1969 is the number two moment in Mets history. One of the most respected and beloved men in the history of New York sports was a former Brooklyn Dodger and manager of the unforgettable 69 team. His name is revered by all who knew him, especially those here at Shea. Please welcome the wife of the late great Gil Hodges, Mrs. Joan Hodges. You've already You've met, met Tommy Agee, Tom, Tom Seaver, Ron Swoboda. Now let's meet some of our 69 Mets. Capped off his career with a world championship ring as a Met. Ladies and gentlemen, third baseman, Ed Charles. For 12 years, this brilliant defensive catcher guided and groomed some of the greatest pitchers of this generation. Two-time All-Star, Jerry Grody. Another Mets All-Star, he served as the club shortstop for 13 seasons. Please welcome Gold Glove winner, Bud Harrelson. The hitting star of the magical Mets season finished third in the league with a 340 batting average. Also made the final catch of the 69 series. Left fielder Cleon Jones. He still holds the club records for most seasons. Games played, hits, doubles, total bases. Bronx native, Ed Cradepool. Only Tom Seaver had more complete games, shutouts, and innings pitched. Still among the leaders in every franchise pitching category, and the winner of the deciding game of the 69 World Series, Jerry Kuzma. This first baseman homered in three of the club's four World Series victories. For his efforts, he was named the series MVP. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Clendenin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we direct your attention again to the diamond vision for the greatest moments in Mets history as chosen by you, the fans. After outlasting the Astros in the NLCS, the 86 Mets advanced to a World Series matchup 
with the Boston Red Sox. The American League champs took games one and two at Shea, forcing New York into a must-win situation at Fenway Park. And for their third consecutive World Series, the Mets' leadoff hitter opened game three with a homer. Len Dykstra's blast sparked a 7-1 Mets victory. When the series shifted back to Shea for game six, the Red Sox were just a win away from the title. Boston broke a 3-3 tie with two runs in the 10th, but New York narrowed the gap with singles by Gary Carter, Kevin Mitchell, and series MVP Ray Knight. Then, with two outs and Mookie Wilson at the plate, reliever Bob Stanley unleashed a wild pitch that tied the game. After fouling off two more pitches, Mookie connected for the most famous dribbler in Mets history. Little roller up along first, behind the bag, it gets through Buckner, here comes Knight and the Mets win it! The Mets rode their newfound momentum into Game 7, coming back from an early 3-0 deficit to lead by a score of 8-5. With two out in the ninth, Jesse Orozco faced Marty Barrett. have won the World Series, and they're jamming and crowding all over Jesse Orozco. The dream has come true. By an overwhelming majority, fans named the spectacular 1986 World Championship as the greatest moment in Mets history. Ladies and gentlemen, together again, the 1986 World Champion New York Mets. Since everybody has uh, been standing for a while and there are chairs, feel free to be seated for a moment. We'll put our 86 Mets back in their chairs. That's an order. I would like to turn the microphone over to the man who you have already met to say a few words on behalf of the players who have been honored here today. My uh, broadcast partner, Tom Seaver. Tom. I think without a doubt there is no expansion franchise which has the history which sits out in front of you today. Uh, a couple of world championships, great players, and a wonderful group of individuals that came here today to share this piece of history with us. From all of us up here, we thank you that are in the ballpark today, and those of you who voted for whatever your favorite was. God bless you all, and have a great game. Very special day at Chase Stadium. We at the WB11 proud to be a part of it. You've been watching the 10 greatest moments in Mets history as brought to you by Chase. Coming up next, the Mets and the Cardinals. But first, you've only seen 10 great moments. There have been many more than that over the 38-year-old history of the team. Now let's take a look at the 30 greatest moments in Mets history. Enjoy. One more.
have won the 1986 National League pennant. And a ground ball quickly. It is a fair ball. It's by Buckner. Rounding third night. The Mets will win the ball game. The Mets win. The Mets have won the World Series. The dream has come true. The National League Eastern Division crown the second time in three years. Ties a National League record for strikeouts in a game. 19 by David Cohn, tying Tom Seaver and Steve Carl. A goner and a record-setting home run for Hundley. Passing Roy Campanella. And as we watched the ceremony, I was looking at the fans and the crowd, everybody with big smiles on their faces, and really didn't matter if you were in your 60s or in your teens, something for everybody, everybody with great memories. Jerry Grody, Mike Piazza, Robin Ventura there, and just a very special day at Chase Stadium as the Mets get set to take on the St. Louis Cardinals and win their sixth in a row. You've been watching WB11's presentation of the 10 greatest moments in Mets history, brought to you by Chase. Now stay tuned as the Mets meet the St. Louis Cardinals next on the WB11. An unsuccessful performance. Greg Garber got an aptitude and an attitude check. Last season, harmony was not a word to describe the New York Giants as an underachieving offense and the impatient defense squabbled. Has that animosity extended to training camp? Yeah, I saw that problem. You know, guys started to mature around here, you know, myself. You know, I wanted to win so bad that, you know, I wanted everybody to live up to my expectation the way I was playing. And one thing about it, you got to make sure everybody play around you. There's no question this team's a lot closer together. Uh, I think that that's been for a while around here, but we've changed a lot of things and, and uh, changed the off-season program. Uh, we had 100% attendance, uh, did a lot of things together as a team. But this team's realized that there's only one way for us to be successful, and that's we all got to be pulling in the same direction. I think you see everybody pulling together. I think you see the D when the offense is on the field, you see the D guys cheering for us and vice versa when they're on the field. And, you know, that's how it's going to have to be. In their first exhibition game, the giant offense raised old concerns by failing to score a touchdown, not to mention losing tight end Pete Mitchell and his 58 catches for at least a month. Every time you lose a guy with his abilities, we have people that can fill in, but you get a little bit thinner, and there's certain things that he's the best at. That's why he's playing it. So we'll have people that will fill in for him, and we're going to have to get him back as soon as we possibly can. Anytime you lose a guy like Pete, it's, it's on hurt us. But one thing about the whole situation, uh, we got a coach and staff that's on uh, get some younger guys and get them mixed into the whole situation, and um, we'll make something happen. One positive sign for the Giants offense, rookie running back Ron Dane, who carried 17 times in the preseason opener and wanted more. With the New York Giants in Albany, I'm Greg Garber, ESPN. Greg, thank you. But then that's your job. Jill Montgomery was the top runner on the Giants last season with all of 348 yards. It's the fourth lowest total by a team's leader since the 16-game schedule was put into effect. We exclude labor issue years. Don't beg Montgomery so much. You know, there's not many uh, number one picks that get a bust of a Great Dane at training camp where everybody walks by all day long and sees this Great Dane. Yeah, you know, they, they make fun of me about that. You know, I said how much I look like it. <laughs> I don't say it look like him, but it's big like him. <laughs> if you had to race that great thing, who would win? I don't know. Probably the dog. <laughs> I give it to I Dane. I, I, yeah, I'll say I Dane has it. I mean, you know, it, it's just no, to me, it's no comparison. To me, it's no comparison. It's early, but the comparisons thus far have been glowing. Dane has already been physically compared to Hall of Fame running back Earl Campbell. Okay, that makes sense. But the other one, Strangely enough, is future Hall of Famer Barry Sanders. The quickest feet I ever seen are on Barry Sanders. 
And I think right now for a big man, I think the second quickest feet i ever seen have to be a Ron Dane. I mean, his feet and the other thing that really, really impressed me is his vision. I looked at one of his rookie cards and his eyes were stretched wide open. I was like, wow, that reminds me of Barry because when he going through holes, his eyes are just so wide open because they're looking at everything. So many guys in one of the Heisman did turn out to be, um, quote unquote, you know, the star players. He will be a star in this league. Because Dane is so immense, 258 pounds and a stout 5'10 frame, he appears to the naked eye to be slow. But Dane and the Giants argue he's actually patient. Instead of just running up in there 100 miles an hour and getting a yard or two, and I'd rather be able to see what I'm going to do. I think he's deceptively fast, but more importantly, he's deceptively quick. Once he hits that hole, once he knows where he wants to go, he gets from point A to point B. Real fast, real fast. Dane breaks it again, still on his feet, and he goes for the end zone! Touchdown, Wisconsin! Oh, what a great Dane run that was! Can we come up with a new nickname? Great Dane was, was a little easy. I think we've kind of gone on into all the refrigerators and the kitchen appliances and the iron heads taken. What should your new nickname be? I don't know. You know, I don't... It don't matter to me. Anything come to mind? Well, I guess we could call him the steamroller. I mean, you know... You got a big, I mean, you got a big man. I mean, I say he's another offensive lineman in the backfield, but I think steamroller sounds a little better than a baby offensive lineman. I'm calling him the Great Dane. When you, a guy's last name is Dane, you call him Great Dane, and that's a slam dunk. In the heat of summer, players sweat. Here's a statistic Ron Dane has built to pad. The Giants have never lost in the Fossil Arrow and a back rushes at least 20 times. Last year was the Giants' worst rushing season since McCarthyism called the Red Zone Scare, if you will. And the Arizona Cardinals beware, the Giants have won three straight season opening games. For more on the Giants' chances this season, log on to www Giants. Forget about it. I don't... His teammates, Herb Williams and John Starks, earlier this evening at the Garden attending the Liberty game, both reacting to the deal that may send Patrick to Seattle. Patrick meant so much to this organization as well as the city, you know, over the years. And, you know, from a, play, uh, from a teammate standpoint, knowing what he'd been through uh, to go out there and produce every night, you know, I think no one outside the players in that locker room understood, you know, uh, the commitment that he had to this uh, uh, organization as well as uh, to the New York Knicks to take the floor to win. Does he get a, a certain amount of freedom from being away from this team in this town? I think he gets a certain amount of freedom from the uh, from the media more so than anything else. I mean, when you play for the Knicks, uh, you're under the microscope. And uh, he's been under more than most. And uh, he's been taking a lot of undue criticism for uh, for a lot of things that, you know, really haven't been his fault. And, um, and that's kind of tough when you get that pressure night in and night out. And it doesn't matter what happens, he's always going to take the brunt of it. You know, if they don't win a championship, it's his fault. Uh, if somebody misses a last shot, it's his fault. If he misses a last shot, it's his fault. It's always his fault. But now that the spotlight is going to focus on somebody else, see if they can handle that pressure. And uh, he's been taking it since I've been here. I've been here for seven, eight years. And uh, he was taking it before then. And for him to come out and play the way he does night after night, it's just a credit to him and his, and his personality and his strength and, uh, and the guy that wants to win. Stephon Marbury spent many nights watching Patrick Ewing as a kid in Lincoln High School, even as a, a collegiate at Georgia Tech, and now as an NBA player. Stephon Marbury, a member of the New Jersey Nets, but again a New Yorker who reacted to the trade of a New York legend. Oh man, that was crazy. That was the most unbelievable thing that ever, ever happened in basketball to me because, you know, growing up from, and being from New York, you know, you see, you've seen him play here for so many years and then for him to go someplace else, it's kind of crazy, but, you know, life moves on and I know he will too. Glenn Rice coming to New York, Vin Baker coming to New York. What kind of players can New York fans expect to see out of those two? Uh, two great talents. Um, with the addition of both of them guys, with the shooter and the guy who could post up and score, you know, you have inside presence and you have the perimeter pretty much sewed up, you know, because Glenn Rice is definitely one of the best shooters in the NBA, and he can do other things. I think with him playing here, it's definitely a plus. In your mind, is this a deal that makes the New York Knicks better? 
I can't say that. I'm a Patrick Ewan fan, man. I can't say that, you know, but if they feel that it's going to make them better, I think that they know. So, I mean, it's, it's hard, man. It, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, and I still can't believe it. You know, I pretty much want to see it sealed and signed and done, you know, but it's amazing. It's amazing. Stefan Marbury with all those superlatives, bringing it all home for all New Yorkers. A lot of us can't believe that it is done. A lot of us feel that it is truly amazing, amazing, amazing. And Patrick does indeed wind up heading west to Seattle. It is a run that ends here at Madison Square Garden without that championship that Patrick coveted and talked about so many times as we take a look back at the life and times of the Nick, Patrick Ewing. The second pick in the 1985 NBA draft goes to the Indiana Pacers. The New York Knicks, for their first pick, select Patrick Ewing of Georgetown. And at center, number 33, Patrick Ewing. And with those words, Patrick began his NBA odyssey, his first basket, coming against Moses Malone and the Sixers. But injuries limited Patrick to all of 50 games in his rookie season. Hubie Brown would be his first NBA coach. And Hubie, well, he tried to convert Patrick, moving him to power forward was a move that Patrick never embraced. In his second season, Bob Hill took over the coaching range. Patrick was energized, but the Knicks still did not make the playoffs. Then Rick Pitino came to town, and the Knicks made it back to the postseason. And it's all over. The Knicks make it to the playoffs for the first time. Ewing loved Rick's offense, his up-tempo style, and developed a one-two punch with guard Mark Jackson. Then under Stu Jackson, Patrick became the first, second, and third options in the Knicks offense. And in the 1990 playoffs, Ewing and the Knicks rallied from a 2-0 deficit to beat the Celtics in a memorable fifth game at Boston Garden. Two years later, Pat Riley followed John McLeod as head coach. Under Riley, Patrick had a great playoff in 1992, highlighted by that inspiring comeback against the Bulls in the Eastern semifinals, a series that the Bulls would win in seven games. In 1993, Patrick reached a milestone, passing Walt Clyde Frazier as the Knicks' all-time leading scorer. And in the 1994 playoffs, Ewing would finally lead the Knicks past the Jordanless Bulls in a seven-game Eastern semifinal, ending four years of playoff utility against Chicago. In the Eastern Conference Finals, Patrick was magnificent again with 24 points and 22 rebounds to erase the Pacers and move into the NBA Finals, where Ewing and the Knicks would suffer a painful loss to the Houston Rockets in seven games. In game five of the 1995 Eastern Semis, Patrick hit the game winner against the Indiana Pacers. But in game seven, Ewing would wear the goat's horns as he missed the infamous layup that would have clinched the game. The following season brought still more changes. Don Nelson was the new head coach, and he and Patrick just didn't mix. So enter Jeff Van Gundy. In February of 1997, more glory for Patrick Ewing, named as one of the NBA's 50 greatest players in their history. A four-year, $68 million deal followed a deal Patrick thought would let him finish career as a Nick. It feels good. It feels good. I mean, I'm, I wanted a few uh, um, athletes to start and finish their career in the same, same, same uniform, <laughs> and I, it feels good to me. Uh, my family. I don't have to pack up and move anywhere else, and I'm just looking forward to winning the championship. In December 1997, Patrick suffered a wrist injury that would start a series of three major injuries over the next three seasons. But Patrick returned in game two of the Eastern semifinals. The Knicks would lose that game, but Patrick had a strong outing in game three. The Knicks would win, 
And Jeff Van Gundy, well, he had nothing but praise for his big center as once again Patrick carried his team on his shoulders, leading the Knicks to a victory under dire circumstances, gaining nothing but praise from the Knicks head coach for his big man. He is put it all in line. He can only be criticized for this because if he's not, if he doesn't play well, he'll be blamed for that. If the team loses with him in there, he'll be blamed for that. If other guys don't play well, he'll be blamed for that. As president of the NBA Players Association, Patrick took a lot of heat for the lockout that shortened the 1999 season. But come playoff time, Patrick was ready and injured Ewing out in a heroic effort in the deciding fifth game against Miami, which led to the historic shot by Allen Houston to clinch the series. But in game two against the Pacers, Ewing's last second miss would prove to be the end of his season due to a torn Achilles tendon. Yet without him, the Knicks advanced to the NBA Finals. Advanced before losing to the San Antonio Spurs for the NBA title. And what would be his final season in a New York Nick, Ewing would miss the team's first 20 games, balancing his desire to get back in the lineup with not wanting to re-injure himself as he had throughout his Nick career. Patrick once again felt the criticism and he took it in his giant stride. In my heart, I mean, I know I've, I've made sacrifices and I have given this team my heart and soul. Um, but do I get credit? If I do, I do. If I, if I do, fine. If I don't, fine. But um, I think we have a, a, a very good team here, and I'm not trying to. I'm not going to try to mess up, you know, mess anything up. I'm just trying to fit in right now. But I'm going to be me. <laughs> But come playoff time, Patrick would again make his mark with a huge seventh and deciding game in the victory over the Miami Heat. After dropping the first two games with Ewing, a foot injury kept Patrick out of games three and four of the conference final against the Pacers, and the Knicks would win both. Ewing would return, and the Pacers, they would go on to win in six in what would turn out to be Patrick Ewing's final game as a New York Knicks. Hard to believe, but those pictures may have to remain burned in our memories forever with Patrick Ewing taking that final walk in a Nick uniform. When we return, we'll talk more about Patrick Ewing and the New York Knicks, the past and the future. And Johnny Hoops Andres joins us on this extended edition of MSG Sports Desk. A night of transition here at Madison Square Garden, a night that is going to call an end to the end of the Patrick Ewing era here with the new.